I'm going to go ahead and ask if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and start turning to the Gospel of John. We're going to be looking this morning, as was already heard through song, about bread. John chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 48 through 51. And it's here that we see Jesus makes a statement. And Lord willing, uh, my, my desire, and I believe it's the desire of the Lord for us, is to, over the next few weeks, look at some of these statements that Jesus makes. You see, in the Gospel of John, Jesus makes several I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. And he makes many of these, and Lord willing, we're going to be looking at them this upcoming few weeks. But today we're going to be looking at when Jesus, in John 6, tells us that he is the bread of life. John 6, starting in verse 48. Jesus says, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. As we enter into this statement that Jesus makes, I am that bread of life, or I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. We have to be made aware of several things. John chapter 6, if you're looking at your Bible, it is a very large chapter in comparison to many of the other chapters in the Gospel of John. There are 71 verses. And it covers a large amount of area, but ultimately what we must understand is right before this, Jesus has just fed the great multitude with loaves of bread and fish. He has fed this great and numerous amount of people. Now we say the feeding of the 5,000, but we know that many times when the counting was done, they would often just either count men or head of household. So it's very likely that there were more than 5,000 people there. And Jesus has, out of seemingly nothing, created this bountiful feast, and he has given them something that would sustain them. And I want you to think for a moment, if you will, about bread. If you're anything like me, it's one of those things that you know you probably shouldn't have too much of, but it's one of those things that every now and again it just gets on your mind. I don't know about you. I think about a nice a warm biscuit in the morning or some cornbread or something like that, a tortilla uh, with all the fixings, if you will. Uh, I think about how bread is used in the world today. Now, today, however, we have a lot of diets. I can't name how many diets there are, but I can tell you just in the last year or so, I've heard about keto, I've heard about the paleo diet, I've heard Atkins is still around, Weight Watchers. People are trying to watch their waist, watch their weight and their figure. And one way many people do this is by cutting certain things out, and one of those things often is bread. But I tell you this morning, during the time of Christ, that would not have been an option. That really would not have been something that could have been done very easily because bread during the time of Christ was quintessential. It was the go-to in your meal. To tell you about my week this week, uh, many of you might think, that I have had one of the most boring weeks because I'm going to tell you that I read an article this week titled The History of Bread. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, that's probably a very short article. Actually, it's, it's quite fascinating. There's a lot to it. The History of Bread, the idea that humans, for our almost entire existence, we have survived on 
bread. We have made it a staple of our households. And in that article, The Brief History of Bread, and I love how it's called The Brief History of Bread because it covers thousands of years, but it says this, that bread in all of its various forms is the most widely consumed in the world. Not only is it an important source of carbohydrates, but it's also portable and compact, which helps to explain why it has been an integral part of our diet for thousands of years. And in looking to the Jews during the time of Christ, their daily diet, every meal would have had something dealing with bread, something that was grain-based, something that was bread-like. They often made bread. They would eat cooked grains, fruit. They would have meat, uh, most likely fish or smaller animals. But bread was very much so essential. And the reason I keep saying that it was so essential to the time of Christ is because when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, to us, if we live in the society that we live in where bread can be put aside, it's not necessary, we've got so many other options, that may not make much sense. We might look at it and say, well, that's an odd statement. But in the time that Christ is speaking, he is speaking in a time when bread was seen as life. Bread was the very thing that would sustain societies through both times of prosper and times of drought. Think about in the droughts and the famines that are often described in the Old Testament. They would have grain set aside or wheat set aside that they could live on. They could sustain themselves in times of difficulty on bread. And when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, ultimately what we must glean from this is the fact that he's saying, I am what sustains each and every one of you. I am what keeps you alive. I am your lifeline. I am your sustainer. You see, Jesus is very much so in control. As we looked at last week, he is with us wherever we go and we seek to preach the gospel. He is in control. But not only is he in control, he is sustaining us in that control. Turn with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. Here we see in this book of Colossians that Paul is writing about the supremacy of Christ. He's writing about how Christ is the greatest and the highest within the church. He is the head of the body. But he makes some statements that ought to cause us to pause and ponder. In Colossians 1, starting in verse 15, look at what Paul writes as he says, Who is, he's talking about Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, All things were created by him and for him. And now notice what verse 17 says. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That's a very short sentence, but it has a lot to it. By Christ all things consist, meaning he is the one who upholds all things. He has not created the world and left it to its own devices He has not simply made all that there is and walked away. No, he has created all things. The Lord God through Jesus Christ created all that we see and he holds it by his hand. He has it everything the way he sees fit for now. He allows it to be. He sustains our lives. He is the one who gives us our existence. You and I would not be here if it were not for Jesus Christ. You and I would not be in this life living the lives that we live if it were not for the sustaining power of God. 
He is the one who keeps us by his hand. Matthew Henry in his commentary on this text says that Jesus not only gave us our life and breath, but he brought us into being and is continually giving them to us. His providence is a continued creation. He holds our soul in life. Meaning we are alive today, we are breathing today, we are here today by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. He is the one who keeps us together. Now I don't have this in my notes, but it comes, uh, it just came to my mind. But I think about in uh, John, I believe it's John 15, where Jesus tells us that apart from me, you can do nothing. Have you ever thought of that? Jesus is the bread of life, and apart from that sustaining power of God, that lifeline, we could do nothing. I love how Paul puts it in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, Paul is preaching here at the Areopagus in Athens, and he has come across a statue. Now, if you know anything about the Greeks and the Romans, they had many different gods. They had a god for this, a god for that, so on and so forth. And Paul comes across a statue dedicated to the unknown god. They were so religious, as Paul points out, he says, they made it a point to make a statue to be for a god just in case they left one out. And this god whom they have forgotten... Paul leads them to the understanding that it is actually the only God. The unknown God that they do not know at the time is God, our living Lord. And in his preaching on this, in verse 28 of Acts 17, Paul says, he's talking about God, for in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. He's speaking here of the Lord our God, that in God we live. In God we breathe. In God we move. It's only by his grace that we are standing. Now the importance here is this, that Jesus tells us that he is that sustainer. The world will try to convince you otherwise. The world wants us to believe that our sustaining grace or the thing that keeps us alive or keeps us going is temporal things. That being things like our wealth. There is a world that is built completely on you have to be the richest or you have to be the greatest. You have to be the highest. This is what life is about. And we see that in all types of media. We see that in history. We see it in today's society that the world says, this is what gives you life. And they say, money gives you life. Or relationships give you life. Your job is what gives you meaning or purpose or life. But I tell you, those things will not last. We know the frailty of life. Turn back with me, if you will, to John chapter 6 and look at verses 49 and 50. Jesus points out the fact that God had been providing for his people for a very long time. And he points to the giving of manna. Now, we know in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, we see that God gives his people sustenance. He has taken them out of slavery in Egypt, and they were wandering in the wilderness and they are hungry understandably so i've been to the wilderness and you know what's there nothing it's just wild uh, and not in necessarily a crazy way it's just empty there's nothing there there's a, a plant every so often but it is quite very much so a deserted place and they would have been looking for food, and we know that they cried out to Moses and Aaron, saying, why have you brought us out into this wilderness to die? Wouldn't it have been better for us just to be slaves in Egypt? We had food there. And God blesses them even in their unthankfulness. 
that he gives them manna. Now the term manna is quite fascinating. I don't know about you, but I love word studies. I love just looking at a word. Where did it come from? Why do we say it? What's its history? Manna, the best understanding we have is it's a question. It's two, ultimately two words, manna. What's this? That's what it translates to. They didn't know necessarily what it was. Their fathers and they had never seen this before. God had provided for them this manna, this feast from the heavens. And it was only by his grace that they survived the wilderness wanderings. But notice in John 6, 49, it says that your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven. And when Jesus says that, I don't know for 100% certainty that he does this, but I can just picture it in my mind that Jesus, when he says that, he's pointing to himself. He says, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that man may eat thereof and not die. You see, the temporal things of this world will not sustain us like Christ sustains us. You might base your life around your wealth. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing to be good stewards of the finances you have. I think you should be wise with your wealth. You should be wise with how you spend what God gives. But it should not be the thing that sustains you. It should not be the thing that when trouble comes, that's the first thing you run to. It should be Jesus, our Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, Paul tells us the fleeting nature of wealth. It cannot sustain us like Jesus can. This world and all its materials and all of its blessings cannot sustain us like Jesus Christ can. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, notice as Paul says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust, notice what he says here, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. When Jesus tells us he's the bread of life, he's saying, I'm what sustains you. You may think your bank account sustains you and it's what keeps you going, but that's here today and could be gone tomorrow. We know the risky nature of things like the stock market or things like finances. We might put our hope in something like that and say, this is what's keeping me going. This is what I live for. And it may be here today and gone tomorrow. That's why I love how Paul puts it. He says, don't put your trust in uncertain riches. There are many in this world today who do that very much so, even within the church who would put their trust not in Christ, but in their own wealth. I tell you, it is temporal. It may not last, and it will not last forever. It may last you your lifetime, but it is not guaranteed forever. What is guaranteed forever for the Christian is life in Christ. When you are at the rock bottom of your life, when you are at the worst moment of your life, it's only Jesus that sustains. He is the one who keeps us going. There are others who, outside of wealth, uh, and, and I, I preached this this morning knowing very well there is a gospel that is going around in the world today, often called the prosperity gospel or the health and wealth gospel, this belief that if you just have enough faith that you will be rich and you will be healthy but I tell you this morning, all those things will fade away. And the only thing that will be left is our Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship with it. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 19, we are promised that we all in this life, now we know of course this is if Christ does not return in our lifetime, we know that this is the promise given to us by God. Genesis 3:19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Interestingly enough, that's the 
uh, term or the meal he chooses to speak about to eat bread because it's so essential. But he says, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shall thou return. Meaning, our health will one day fade away. We may be in good health today, we may be uh, relatively well now, but we all know the reality that health is not a guaranteed thing. It's not something we ought to put our trust in and saying, well, I am healthy today, and because of that, I'm going to be healthy forever. No, it means we are healthy today, but we don't know what tomorrow gives. I tell you this coming out of having had the virus. Uh, it's been about a month now since I've had the COVID virus, and I was very well one day, and the next day I had a little tickle in my throat, and the next day I started coughing, and the days progressed and I got worse and worse and worse, and as you know here today, it affected several members of my family. My grandmother passed away. My mother was very ill for a while. She is recovering, and I am thankfully recovered as well. But our health is not guaranteed can be there one day and gone the next. What is guaranteed is that Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He sustains us even in our good health and our bad health. Jesus is there. He is the everlasting sustainer. Albert Barnes in his commentary on John chapter 6 writes this. He, he gives us three things we ought to consider. He says, the bread which they, speaking about those in the wilderness, ate, could not save them from death. God interfered on their behalf, yet they died. And he says, we may learn three things. One, that that is not the most valuable of God's gifts, which merely satisfies the temporal ones. God does bless us with temporal blessings. He blesses us with things in this life, but those things are not what truly will satisfy us forever. They may satisfy us for a moment. They will not sustain us forever like Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life. Two, the most distinguished temporal blessings will not save from death. Wealth, friends, food, raiment, these will not preserve our lives. Just a reminder, the fleeting things of earth and the eternal promise of Jesus Christ. Where the world fails, Christ does not. And three, he says there is a need of something better than mere earthly blessings. There's a need of that bread which cometh down from heaven and which giveth life to the world. And I ask you here this morning, or if you're watching online today, what is it that you put your hope in? What is it that you put your trust in? Is it your earthly blessings? Is it the stuff that you have, the things that you own? Or is it your relationship with living God, with Jesus Christ? What is it that sustains you? What is it that keeps you going? And I tell you, for the Christian, it ought to be that relationship we have with the Lord. In the Lord's Prayer, we see this very articulated point when Jesus is saying this is how you ought to pray he says our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread when we pray to the Lord to give us our daily bread what is our main focus in that are we mainly focusing on the physical things that God can bring us or are we mostly focusing on the fact that the daily bread, I, I truly believe the most important thing God can give us is more of himself, is a relationship with him. When you sit down and read scripture, and I, I pray that, that you do, if you don't have a time each morning or each evening, wherever it fits in your schedule, where you sit down and, and study scripture, it doesn't have to be necessarily chapters upon chapters. It could be just a verse here and there every day just to 
read the scriptures, when you sit down in your time of devotion, are you more focused on what the Lord can give you materially or what we can receive from the Lord spiritually? Now, I'm not saying that the material things are not important because they are. We know that the physical things that we have, many of them, are necessary. We need money to pay our bills. We need a house to live in. We need certain things. But they should not become our main source of hope. They should not become our main sustainer. We should not look to our material blessings as the things that keep us going. But that which is Christ should be our sustainer every day. And that's where we look back to John chapter 6 verse 51. It says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread... He shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And if you know anything about church history, if you know anything about Christ and the gospel, probably something came to mind when he says that the bread I will give is my flesh. We as the church celebrate communion or uh, the Lord's Supper. We celebrate as a remembrance. And if you see this table down here this morning, if you're here, it says, in remembrance of me. Jesus commands the church to remember him when we take the Lord's Supper. And when we do that, we say, this bread is that which was Christ's body. And this wine is representative of Christ's blood. And we take them in remembrance, knowing that if we believe in Jesus Christ, that flesh that he laid down on the cross and died and was resurrected, that sacrifice that was given, if we believe in him and in his grace, if we have faith that is given to us by our Heavenly Father, we will not die forever we may physically face death in this life but that will not be our end that will be a mere stepping stone into eternity with Jesus Christ you see if you believe in Jesus Christ if you believe that he is the bread of life if you trust in him as your sustainer as your Lord as your redeemer I tell you this morning That will last forever because we are given the promise in scripture that everlasting life is given to those who believe. And we know that belief, of course, cometh from the Father above. No man can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. If you believe this morning, put your trust in Jesus Christ and know that he is the sustainer I tell you this morning, he will sustain you through the rest of your life. And if Jesus Christ does not return in your lifetime and you pass away, he will still be your sustainer in glory. He will be your sustainer for all time. When uh, even I'll go further, when time stops, Jesus will continue to be your sustainer. You see, when we are in our father's kingdom, when we are in heaven, There will be no need for light. There will be really no need for anything, ultimately, because Jesus Christ is all we need. He will be there and our sustainer. And I tell you, that doesn't start, and it shouldn't start, when you pass away. You don't start getting prepared for things in that manner. We cannot wait to make Jesus our sustainer wait and say well I'll I'll live off of the material things of this world and when I'm ready then I'll put my trust fully in you then I'll put my hope fully in you then you can be my sustainer no because we don't know what tomorrow may bring and I simply end this morning with a passage out of John it's a chapter prior to the one we are in John chapter 5 verse 
24. John 5, verse 24, Jesus gives us this promise. And I pray that as we've looked at him as being the living bread or the bread of life, that you remember if you have faith in Christ, this promise is to you. He says, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. The things of this world you may partake in, they will not keep you alive forever. Just like those in the wilderness, that manna, they they survived for a period of time, but it didn't keep them alive forever. But what keeps us alive eternally is our faith in Jesus Christ. My prayer for us this morning is this, that we put our trust wholly on him And let the world's distractions fade away that we might look to Jesus and know that he is the one who keeps us alive. He's the one who we ought to be living our lives for, knowing there is no one worthy of worshiping besides our living Lord and our heavenly God. I pray that you are encouraged and reminded to do this. And as we take in that daily bread that he offers us, that sustaining power, remember that even in the darkest of times when it's difficult to trust him, he will still sustain. Even when it doesn't make sense, he will still sustain. Let us, therefore, put our faith in Christ.